You're on. Well, good evening, everybody, once again. I hope you enjoyed that uh, lovely meal. I certainly did. I thought it was great. What we're going to do now is um, hand out the uh, voting slips. So everybody's entitled to one voting slip, and that includes our inventors who are displaying tonight. Everybody gets one voting clip. A slip. Um, John. Your own product. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, most definitely, John. And only once, though. Now, uh, John Whitehead. Uh, oh, John. John is over here. John's going to give those voting slips out now. He'll be coming around, uh, giving it to everybody. And um, while we're sort of uh, doing that, we'll have we'll have a little bit of time um, after uh, another ten minutes or so. We'll have a little bit of time to go back up and have a look at the benches, but um, it, well, it'll be a bit longer than that because I'm going to interview each of the inventors first. So there's still plenty of time to fill out your voting slip. You don't have to do it immediately. Um, what I would like to uh, do just in the meantime is introduce to you um, a very special guest. Bill Allardyce. Bill, would you come up here, please? Bill, as you may remember, is the author of A Practical Guide to Inventing, which we have been using periodically, periodically to um, help inventors, and each new inventor gets a copy of Bill's book. Um, I edited it and uh, brought it up to date a little bit. Um, on, on some aspects, because uh, some of the government departments, I mean, you, you yeah, listed no, heaps of them, you know, some of them are gone now. Um, and uh, Bill started off with his invention here called Aussie Chopsticks. You can't go wrong. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like, um, just to fill in a bit of time while we're having our sweets, um, I'd like Bill to Tell us, if you could, Bill, just a little bit of your story, how it began and, and, and where it got you, and, you know, just where it went. Thank can you, you do that? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <coughs> how this first uh, eventuated, I was waiting for my brother-in-law and we were fencing, and I had a piece of high tensile wire and I bent it into that shape. And I started picking up bits of bark and things on the ground. I thought, I'll make chopsticks out of that. So I had the idea to do it in stainless steel. And off I went. And like most inventors, I'm doing it this way. Right? And uh, they said, oh, no, you've got to make them out of plastic. I said, no, 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 we're doing them out of stainless steel. They'll last forever and they're better. And they said, no, no, no. Anyway, finally, they convinced me to make them out of plastic. But to get started, there was an investment of $20,000 for the injection moulding die. And when it opens, it drops four out each time. And uh, that's quite a big investment. Then you've got your packaging, your plastic bags. Plastic bags, 100,000 bags, minimum run, right? To put two in a bag. Uh, cards, to put them on, minimum run, 60,000 cards. So, a bit of advertising promotion, there was an investment there of $80,000 before I sold the first one. So, you've got to believe in your product. I did, managed to get the money and pushed ahead. I've sold 250,000 of these to the Amway Corporation, 350,000 to Tupperware, and the rest went out to Coles, Myers, and places like that and sold about 1.5 million in total. So it was a fairly, fairly successful invention. And uh, I don't know if some of, you can, some of you would remember Charles Sandercock. Charles was a good friend of mine and he was a patent attorney here. And he was very well educated. He used to say, oh, Bill, 
you're wasting your money and my time. You'll never sell any chopsticks, <laughs> right? And I used to say to him, 500,000, 700,000. Oh, Bill, I'm so pleased. <laughs> and uh, you, you can't know. And the thing is, it's very easy in this business uh, to be, how can I put it? I'm trying to think of the right wording, but to be squashed or have your dreams crushed by people, this won't work, that won't work. Uh, if you want advice, go down to the local hotel. The people down there have never done anything, but they know damn well how you should do it. Right? And my way of doing things now is to say, <coughs> how many inventions do you commercialise? <laughs> oh, none. Well, isn't that interesting? Keep your opinions to yourself and you know, I'll go off to someone who's got experience. So uh, that's just a little bit of a story. We haven't got overseas yet. Uh, at one stage I was nervous about the die going overseas and uh, I sent a die to America and it came back again. So now I think I'll send the chopstick die over to China. There's about a, uh, a million tourists over there a year that can't use chopsticks, so you never know what will happen there. Uh, all right, well, thank you, Peter. I think my five minutes is up. <laughs> and, oh, also, just before I finish, I bought a box of chopsticks in, so grab two or three or whatever you want, uh, and we'll share on the round. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bill. I'm sure that uh, Ben will be very happy to take a couple of those. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's terrific. Um, he's a good storyteller. Good storyteller. Uh, now, I think it's probably time for me to, uh, to move around and talk to each of the inventors. Uh, which one has finished sweets first? Who we got? Come on, inventors. <laughs> Who wants me to interview them? Yeah, Peter, you go first. Archie. Come on, Peter. Peter Barrett, number three on the card. Uh, you'll have to fill in the number. Did you notice that on your voting card? Just fill in the number um, and the invention. This invention, you know, or either one, we'll pick that up. This invention is a biofeedback device. Now, as far as I know, um, and I'll get Peter to clarify this, the feedback device is on uh, weight and joint ankle. Um, so if a stroke victim um, can't sort of feel how much weight he's applying to one side, then this device will enable them to to sense how much weight they're putting on and therefore they should be able to recover easier or faster uh, because they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and without this they can't feel that. Um, I heard that uh, Queensland Physio just uh, recently said that um, 30 minutes of this gave a significant improvement against any other existing device on the market at the moment. Um, the, uh, there's a seating, this biofeedback bio is also, uh, there's a seating pad which stops um, uh, straight people from becoming lopsided when they sit down. They can then, uh, through a sensor, know that they're tilting over rather than always having to have a mirror in front of them or, or some other way you know, to know that they're sitting up straight. Um, Peter uh, was a winner of the Floriata Aspiring Inventors Award, uh, just uh, a couple of months ago uh, with this product and um, Peter I'm not sure how the angle part of it works or what hyper extension is can you just say a couple of words about your product and just tell people okay yeah no, no, Peter's pretty well covered it because the, the idea is, is to um, the pads are for the weight bearing to because people from the have had a stroke they don't feel that they put hit the ground so it's good for people, for any, anybody with a right brain injury, really. Um, people have met with the setting pads, right? Um, it's lopsided, and, and the beauty of it is, is that the feedback's immediate, and um, you're not required to, there's no physio there, not required to um, 
as shall I say, you know, encourage all the time. They can be off doing something else. And with regarding the knee angle, uh, Peter asked me about the uh, what it does when people have a stroke. They hyperextend their knee a lot, and it, 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 um, it really they crunch their knee, and it's not a, it's not good for the knee. So if they so what this does it beeps up and say about it's set it to 90 degree, but it beeps up about five degrees. And the other thing is for the people will set it to 60 degrees because you need 60 degrees of flexion to get up the stairs. So, so if somebody's going home, they need to get uh, you know, 60 degrees of flexion. Thank you, uh, Peter. So there's a lot of feedback. Thanks. Come on, where are you? There he is. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Now, this cranberry bitter has got two inventions. Rod Shepherd. Uh, which one? The Echo Switch one? Sure. Now, the Echo Switch here, Rod, Rod has invented this product. Um, would you like to hold it up? Oh, or yep, sure thing. The um, Echo Switch enables you to switch any appliance or device from any location. You don't have to bend down and get underneath and break your back, you know, which causes you to leave things on rather than turn them off. And we know that um, leaving things on standby does use a lot of power. Um, it reduces that uh, standby, I believe, to zero. And um, we we all have, uh, we've all seen, I think, the Ecotech or whatever they are, the, the ones that are given away free, Embertech, the ones that are given away free um, to us through a government program, and uh, I've had a couple of those at home, I must admit, uh, they are supposed to stop the, um, uh, what you say, uh, the standby power by turning the appliance off. Well, I think Rod's got a very good viewpoint here where this is very much better again, but I'll put right on, he can just quickly explain it to you. Okay, well just finishing off about the, uh, the Empatec products, as everybody probably knows, they, um, uh, they actually use standby power themselves. Is this working? Can you yeah, but you need to keep it close to the... Oh, okay. So, um, the Empatec products actually use standby power themselves, so in many cases they're um, consuming standby power in excess of the, the savings that they've um, intended to save. Uh, look, I really like to. Uh, I, really, I really like to uh, boil the problem down to its essence. And uh, when, we, when it comes to standby power and saving standby power, the problem is no more complicated than um, people want to turn off their standby power, but their their power point is often buried behind behind uh, furniture or somewhere awkward to reach. That's usually problem number one. And then the second problem is that they find it uh, difficult to remember to turn off their standby power. This Ego switch, um, it's got a plug on one end for which goes into your power point. It's got a socket on the other end to which you can plug into it a power board with any number of devices or appliances or indeed just a single appliance, unlike the Evertech type products. And then from the middle of that comes a, another extension cord at the end of which is a switch. So uh, we can mount this switch anywhere we like um, you can even put it next to your light switch and turn your light and power off at the same time if you wanted. So uh, we've effectively solved the first problem, which is I'm finding it difficult to reach my power point by bringing the power point now effectively out. It's got some double-sided tape and some clips and things too to keep it all tidy. Um, and in terms of I forget to turn off my power point, well, as you saw before when I held it up, there's a little lamp inside it that grows, that glows this eerie green uh, uh, light emanating from under your doors at night. Which is, I'll have to plug it back in again. Oh. <laughs> but trust me, a closed screen. Um, and so basically that's it. Oh, there are other uses beyond um, simply saving standby power. And that might be you've got an appliance, sorry, a, a tool or a piece of equipment in your workshop, for instance, that um, may have a broken switch. And so you, you're not an electrician, you don't want to pay one to fix that switch. You can you know, tape it on permanently and use the Ego switch to bypass it. You can also use the ego, ego switch to. Um, it's the distance. Yep. You can also also use the ego switch to. Um, I don't think it is. No, I think there's something else going on. Your voice manager is louder than the mic. Okay. Turn off. switch. You can also use the ego switch in your workshop. You might want to. Um, you might in your workshop. In my workshop, I've got uh, the dust extractor way over in the corner over there and I've got my table saw all the way over there. Now I want those two things to be working together. 
I don't have to walk all the way over there to turn on the, the uh, dust extractor to go back and then turn on the table saw. And then when I'm finished doing what I was doing on the table saw, I have to go back again and turn off the dust extractor. So uh, we simply just, we can connect these two together and hang this off the rafters, if you like, in my shed and just go, okay, both on, both off. So there's a you. bunch of... Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was great. Uh, number five, Mike Shepard, Echo Switch. Bernard McCann, where are you? Bernard, uh, Bernard has a collapsible laundry basket holder. This is, this is in the very early stage, and uh, Bernard came up with this idea, I think it's great. Um, he's just roughly made this up, but basically if this was a washing machine, with that washing machine, you could have this um, in, a, in a plastic cover, about half that thickness perhaps. And uh, would you like to show us how this collapsible? Yeah, laundry basket works. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da! Yeah. So it's nice to put your washing in there and uh, away you go. Uh, the line or large parts of the house or so basically the idea is that you're saving space, you haven't got a, a washing basket uh, floating around which falls away basically, it's out of your, out of your sight. And, uh, and, uh, washing baskets take up a lot of room. Yeah, it's a space saving idea I guess. Even some people have, might have three people in the house, might have three baskets going just on the other day. Uh, so you put your washing in, take it to, take it to the line, when you're finished, put your, put your basket back and uh, go away. Well this is a prototype that uh, Bernard has made himself, uh, just quickly to show us the, the operation, I, th I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of work to, to get that tooling and so forth or whatever to design it, but um, I think it's got a hell of a lot of good uh, use. Uh, you've got a, you wouldn't believe the laundry baskets that we've got in our house. <laughs> so I understand the use uh, for it. Um, all right, Bernard, um, thank you very much. <laughs> Collapsible laundry basket holder. And number four. Um, who else? Uh, what about Sam? Sam? Yep. Now, uh, Sam Spitaro has uh, a very interesting concept here. Sam would like this to be a perpetual motion machine. Um, you've probably seen the video there where he has built a, a larger sized unit and um, we might we might have to turn that off I think. It'll turn yeah. off by itself in like 10 seconds. Okay, um, you would have all seen that but um, the idea is that these floats come down a stack with gravity, they come into the bottom and this is Sam's real invention is how to get gravity-fed floats into a buoyancy column of water. Is that correct, Sam? Mm -hmm. yeah. And by doing that, he's using the buoyancy of the floats to generate electricity. They come down by gravity, which is free, and Sam thinks that this would generate electricity at approximately half the cost of any present method of generating electricity and I think Sam you point out that with wind farms mm -hmm. uh, when the wind stops you have no electricity with solar when it's night time or cloudy you don't have any electricity with yours it can be continuous operation all day long it's very easy to install in sites very large units I mean I mean I think Sam envisages uh, how many meters long uh, it is one square meter by five meter long. So five meters, would that be about 
Yes, this distance? The, yeah, yes, about this, one square meter. And if you've got a hundred of them on top of, on top of each other. So a lot, into, a, yes. a very tall column? Yeah, yes. Into, in, into a reservoir or a tank, yep. whatever you want to call And this one will generate in a day, it will generate, uh, <laughs> choose a second, about 400, uh, yes, you got it there. <laughs> it will generate about 464 megawatt a day, 24 hours. And the expenses, it, the only expenses is to pump back the water into the system. That's the only expenses. And this will, uh, will be only five megawatt, no more. So that's the only expense. <laughs> and this is why, this is why I think the, it will, uh, the cost, uh, mm -mm, the cost of, of electricity will be reduced, uh, reduced by 50% uh, compared to the Nova Day price. No, not just the cost of production, but the cost to us. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I have to clarify here, Sam, and say that you haven't proved the electricity part of it no, yet, not, but not yet. it's not engineering data to say this is what it should be, but it, <coughs> we haven't got to a stage where it actually produces electricity at this point in time yeah, yeah. to absolutely prove the concept. But you have designed and invented the system to make this work using buoyancy and gravity two free energy components mm -hmm. and a continuous motion system. Yeah, yes. And the invention has been made for this. Uh, uh, this is the, the proof of concept. See, because usually all, all of them, they couldn't, they never, how do you say that? The, the cost of uh, pushing this one, the float from an uh, air environment into aquatic environment, the the price, uh, the, the cost to pass it from there to there, it would uh, would be the the gener generating of this uh, would never cover the cost. And this is why it never it never worked. So but your your invention yeah, it enables is it to go in at a very low energy cost. Absolutely right? no cost at all. Yeah, no cost at all. <laughs> well, the, the, you do use. Because air, an air valve system? No, no, no. no. It, is so, it is so simple. <coughs> Pardon. It is, as you can see here, if you can. No, I'm saying to get this yeah. float in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need a mechanism. Oh, yeah, yes, it is very, very easy. Very, very easy. And that mechanism can run off the electricity that this generates. That generates, yeah, yes. So. The, <coughs> the float comes from here <coughs> into, into the chamber, close the chamber, the water is fed underneath, the water is fed underneath. Just and for that chamber? Yeah, yeah, to the chamber. And the, the buoyancy, the buoyancy will push up the system. Okay, but the input, the, to pass it from the air into the, it is so, it was complicated, but it is so simple because now, as you say, when you got, you all uh, learn this, but uh, at school, because everybody learned this at school, it is uh, uh, the law of physics. It is uh, a tube, when you got a U tube, so if you pour water in one side, assuming that in, in between there is a, a door. So the water goes there and stops there. Yes, in, in, into the into the. But if the there's bed. a door, yeah, yeah. the more you pour but water in, the more it'll go through the door. Yeah. If you unlock the door, the, the the pressure of the water will come and lift at the uh, at the other side. And this is the discovery. And so that's that's what you've done here. Yeah. When you put some water in the bottom, you've got a very large water column here, but that pressure equalizes the top. And then it will just float upwards. Yeah, equalise yeah. the pressure. It is because because see, here we got uh, one reservoir, and next to it, next to it, you put exactly the same, uh, the same reservoir with the uh, with exactly the same weight from this one, yeah. and put it in, into the other one. So it equilibres itself. Ah. So with the pressure, with the pressure coming underneath. So the, there is equivalence between the top pressure because assuming here we got a, a pressure of uh, 300 uh, 
the 300 ton. So you got to have exactly the same pressure here underneath. And so if you got the, this has been re re realized with the adjunction of a twin, twin uh, uh, reservoir. Right. And when you got the water underneath, it lifts by itself because it okay. is equilibrated. All right. Well, this is uh, invention number two. Um, perpetual motion. It's not exactly a perpetual motion yet because you haven't got the proof of the electricity, but this is the, the beginning the of, of that. That's the no. invention. Yeah, this is the invention. The valve enabling potentially a um, perpetual motion generator of electricity. Um, number two, uh, perpetual motion, um, Sam uh, Spataro. Let's go down to the bottom. Clever inventor. And Archie has invented the one minute Christmas tree. Hey. Archie. <laughs> this, before, I, before I do a quick introduction, can you tell us why it's a one minute Christmas tree? Basically, it comes pre decorated and just simply folds in half. And straight back up. So you open this box. Yeah. You get one end. I can do a demonstration. And put it on the wall. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do a demonstration. Yeah. We'll put it back in the box there. Right? So that's the one. Uh, yeah, tight. Get up. I get this wrong. You got to time it. You've already got to watch. So, all back. Up in the box there. Star in. Okay, who's going to stop watch? Anybody? Anybody got on their phone? You ready? Go! The one minute Christmas tree, a warm man at Christmas tree. Folds. Box. Lid off. Star up. Done. Up on the wall. The light's not working, Archie. That's fine. Plenty of time, Pete. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> How long? How long was that? Anybody recorded? 25 seconds. 25, 30 seconds. Well, you're lying to us. What's this one minute Christmas tree? It's only lies. It covers all consumers, even the slow ones. Can you straighten your start, please? That takes an extra 30 seconds. Now, this is the product for sale here. Um, the selling points are that it sits flat on the wall, so that means it's great for um, flats, apartments, um, houses where there's a lot of kids, because Archie's got um, a battery-operated LED system which lasts for a long time. You just press the button and they work. 200 hours on flash mode. 200 hours. It's pre-decorated like that. You can add decorations if you want to, but you haven't got any cables coming down to the power points where kids can mess around and pull them out and you haven't got um, you know cables and lights where you might cause a fire somehow if they did the wrong thing. And you can't trip <coughs> over anything. Um, you can put all your presents underneath um, but it's flat, it doesn't take real up any space at all, it's out of the way and that's what Archie envisaged, something that you could you know keep under the house Bring it out next Christmas, one minute, bang, up we go. Christmas tree. Um, Archie has already got them into um, uh, other places too. Um, offices, cafes, nightclubs. Now, Archie has made some other sizes. This is one size. But uh, Archie does commercial business with this. Um, this is the item that he has for sale to the public. But it's the same invention. Um, so um, he's already got into a, a number of places and he's just really introduced it, I think, this year. Is that right, Archie? Absolutely, yes. And it's come to market this year in uh, November. We started selling. And we've got them in post offices, cafes, restaurants, apartments, homes, uh, one nightclub there, um, uh, massage offices as well. What else? Uh, our frescoes, so it's weather resistant, indoors, outdoors, our frescoes, balconies. And this is not schools. This yes. is not normal uh, uh, 
uh, artificial it, turf, isn't it? It is artificial turf. It, I've actually designed this one for the Christmas tree. So it looks a bit better than. That's right. That's where the original one I actually made a photo, but it was a real tarnish, very uh, dull olive green type colour. And then um, I've actually got another photo there as well, but it's actually colour coded to an actual uh, real pine tree there as well. It actually mimics the colours there. So I've actually designed this grass over in um, China there. When over there, got the, the density, the curly underlay, the colours. Um, basically, went for a 30 mil uh, length there. It's a nice, happy medium, and also um, with some for synthetic grass there as well, doing landscapes. So, but yeah, with the Christmas tree, it comes pre decorated. The garland bee doesn't move, it's all locked in, so that's the beauty about it. It just stays in position every time. So, there's no decorations. The only thing you have to do is place the velcro to start straight on there. So, and the, what's that hook? Yeah, that's just a glass hook there, just a, um, a self. Or a double side tape there, yeah. look there. Take that off? No. Yeah, so absolutely. Come <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just a mounting wire there on the back there. Got a battery case. And the beauty of the other, with your batteries, you don't have to take the tree back off the wall. Take your case straight off and change your batteries that way while it's still on the wall. So just another little one percenter. Another little one percenter as well. It's basically got the uh, protective pads there for your plasterboard type walls there. Um, the grass in the back there protects the wall. Um, the hinges, and then the edge. I think with uh, apartment living, you know, coming upon us at a massive rate of knots, uh, that's really the way to go. I can't see people taking the Christmas trees upstairs and. <laughs> and the it's just take paint off the wall. When you take the hook away? You can actually use the existing feature hook there. So I'd use the actual uh, the brass hooks there. Mm -hmm. Just a normal standard brass hook there. Three and a half kilos. So if so you had a picture way. hook with a picture, you could just take that down and put it But if you didn't? Yeah, just put an actual picture hook up. Or if not, you could use a mannequin stand. Um, well, you've got a stand? Yeah, you do mannequin stands. I basically use these for shop fronts. Okay. Yeah, so you got that. Mm -hmm. that straight out. Straight in the stand and such. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's basically it's a smartphone of Christmas trees. Easy <laughs> <laughs> and it's efficient. Cool. And it's compactable and it does, and it's flash. <laughs> Archie, that's fantastic. Yeah. Archie Grogan. <laughs> Number seven. And in seven percent it goes to make a wish yeah. foundation there as well. Oh, very so, good. One minute Christmas tree. Okay, Rob Shepherd. Number seven. Now, Rod um, has a great product here called Pump Defender. Uh, this is basically to uh, protect firefighting pumps. Um, if you choose to stay or if you're caught and, and you have to stay, you're going to have to you know, turn on your pump and spray everything with inside, especially yourself, but try to keep the property protected. Now, if anything happens to that pump while you're spraying and the bushfire is close by, well, you can imagine that you're not going to survive. So anything at all stops that pump, you're not going to survive. Um, Rod recognised that. Rod's a um, uh, black... Friday, uh, what is it? Black Saturday. Black Saturday Survivor uh, in uh, Marysville. <laughs> Member of the CFA. And he recognised this uh, problem. Um, Ron, uh, Rod put this into the um, sheep venture at Hamilton uh, show and won first prize. So congratulations to everybody. <laughs> Also entered it at the Henty Field Days and was runner-up, so he's done pretty well. Um, and there's a few ribbons and things here. Um, Bendigo Inventor Awards. It was uh, entered there. Um, was there anything uh, particular? Did you get into a category there? Uh, the category for that was the Agriculture and Environmental Sustainability, and uh, also a finalist in the Emerging Innovation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the same one that uh, Peter Barrett uh, won. Uh, Rod was, uh, uh, no, not, not that one, no, 
Which one was the emerging innovation? Sorry. That was That's Bendigo uh, the year before? Ah, the year before. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Rod, what, what can you tell us? How does this work? What does it actually do? Okay, well, once again, um, this is a firefighting pump, and people who choose to stay and defend their homes, and indeed people who choose to leave early but somehow are caught uh, by circumstance and end up staying in wildfire situations, ought to have a firefighting pump. Now, uh, we're told by our emergency agencies that um, when the fire front comes, or indeed before the fire front, there'll be smoke, there'll be embers, there'll be flames, there'll be radiant heat, all sorts of annoying things that'll uh, be very uncomfortable and life-threatening, so shelter from all that stuff, go inside, and when you re-emerge outside, um, there'll be lots of spot fires, now's the time to put out the spot fires. Well, of course, we know that the power's the first thing that's going to go off, so you need an autonomous pump, usually a petrol or a diesel powered pump. Um, but of course, within that advice, we now emerge out of our house ready to put out those spot fires, but who's been protecting our firefighting pump out in the fire while well, we've been sheltering inside? Well, nobody. So um, you don't want to emerge from your home to find you've got no firefighting pump. I found after uh, the Sunday after Black Saturday, visiting my, uh, my neighbours in my CFA capacity to see how I could help, that many of the people that stayed, for whatever reason, they'd lost the fight because their firefighting pump failed. Uh, obviously it failed um, because it may have caught fire, or um, plastic components could melt through radiant heat. Uh, some people even claimed that their pumps had uh, run out of oxygen, particularly those that, where people would put a pump, thinking they were doing the right thing, put the pump into a pit with a pit sheet of tin over the top and a couple of bricks. Well, obviously it's going to run out of oxygen, which is what they claimed happened. But the saddest case of all, that I heard was where people had uh, committed themselves to stay and fight the fire, so they're 100% committed to stay. Um, they're 98% sure they're going to survive, so they've put their pets inside their home and they've, uh, they've left their memories and their, um, you know, their life memories inside their home. Uh, they've got their firefighting pump going, they're at the end of the hose, there's smoke in, in the air and there's embers moving across the top, so they're, they're ready, they're ready for the fire, they can smell it, it's coming, come on, bring it on and uh, their pump stops. So they go, oh, okay, well, we'll start the pump, we'll start the pump, we'll start the pump, we'll start the pump, the pump doesn't start. Start the pump, start the pump, pump, still won't start. What's happened is, it was already a hot day, let's face it, total fire bans are by nature. Days when fire come by nature are hot days. All engines have the carburetor right next to the, uh, to the engine, right next to the exhaust. These might be in the sun as well. What's going to happen, and what happened for these people, was that their fuel had vaporised, the petrol had boiled, which meant that their pump no longer worked. So they'd gone from 98% sure they're going to survive, this 100% definitely going to stay, to, oh shit, we have to leave, and we have to leave late, and in a panic. Goodbye house, goodbye memories, goodbye pets, simply because they didn't have a means by which they could protect their firefighting pump from, in their case, uh, fuel vaporisation. So that's the pump defender. It's just a simple little device. Like Da Vinci said, you know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And it simply just goes on to the, uh, to the manifold of the impeller and, um, and creates a sprinkler. It's not a hair growth machine or anything. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't have lights. I wish it was. But, um, <laughs> it doesn't have lights. No, no, no. So this represents the water. That's right. Coming out 360 degrees. That's right. It just gives that little fan or, or yep. umbrella. It, it protects the firefighting pump against all those things that I mentioned, but also creates a wet zone around the firefighting pump so you can store your fuel next to your firefighting pump. So instead of having two unprotected locations, your pump and your fuel, you've got one protected location. They're adjacent where they need to be. Um, uh, it's also safer to refuel. If you've ever seen fuel vapours when you're pouring, re, you know, filling up a container, petrol, the vapours go right across the ground, spread across the ground, the hotter, the faster they spread. Well, those vapours now are across wet ground, so if there's any embers circulating turbulently, and it's a lot safer. fill underneath the umbrella of water. It's not a circle of water, it's, it's a, a whole field of water that this creates. But when you're filling it up, you're not putting water into your tank, are you? Yes, you are putting water into your tank, but you're refueling over the wet ground. ground. Oh no, you switch petrol. You put petrol in the tank. Yes. But you're inside this protected area and the water's out here. Well this when isn't spraying. When this when isn't you spray refuel. This isn't spraying when you're refueling. Oh, what okay. I'm saying is you're refueling over a oh, wet okay. ground. Okay. And that same wet ground, we, we might have our fuel stored as well. Um, if worse comes to worse and you lose the very thing that's keeping you alive, like your radiant heat protection, usually your home, if that catches on fire and you can't save it, 
and you're outside and you're caught out in the open, you have no, no other place to hide, you could in fact, I don't know, grab your canary if you want, and you and the canary in the cage actually just criddle underneath this thing and still have a better chance of survival than you certainly would out in the open. Supplementary to the bushfire situation, there's another use as well. I had a guy at a, uh, one of these field shows I went, field days I went to. He came up to me and he said, I want one of your pump defenders for uh, my transfer pump. Not for firefighting purposes, but just simply for transferring water from one place to another. In his case, it was a dam to his stock troughs. He lived in irrigation country. Bushfires weren't on his radar, according to him. Anyway, I was listening to him. And he says, oh, that's my transfer pump. I said, yeah, go on, what are you talking about? And he says, he says, my pump's down there in summertime working on the dam 24-7. I'm not unattended. I'm not down there looking after it. Nobody's looking after it. He says, I don't want my pump to be the cause of the next fire. Chinese pumps, spark arresters can rust and fail. And if you've ever seen a stationary engine running at night time, somebody here showed me they've got a burn from theirs. Who's that? It's got the burn from... There we go. Thank you, Tony. I mean, uh, Gary. Gary. He's got a burn there from the stationary engine. If you see these things running at night time, the exhaust glow is red hot. And as the farmer said, jokingly to me, he says, yeah, lucky we see that at night and we say to ourselves, gee, if we don't see that during the daytime, lucky about that. So, you know, it could be um, uh, on that same hot day, lots of sticks, windblown debris, fuels blow up against the exhaust pipe and ignite a fire. So two days later, there's this big black triangle leading back to this irrigator's pump. You know, who's, who's, who are they going to saw, you know, in the court? They're going to get that guy. All right. Well, I think that's a brilliant invention. Uh, all of these are brilliant inventions. Uh, so this is Pump Defender, Rod Shepherd, number six. Cool. Tell me, John, what does cool one stand for? It's a, an Aboriginal handcrafted wooden vessel which is used to carry bush tucker when they're collecting bush tucker and also to carry babies or to cradle babies. So well, I'll, this, this I'll does just, the same thing. I'll do a quick rundown and you can um, explain the rest, John. John um, has produced here a stroller. Uh, with all of the Australian regulations for safety, in fact exceeds them, for a baby above the stroller facing the mother or parent, um, carer, I don't know, um, with a, a container underneath that's large enough to store pretty much a week's shopping underneath there, plus the baby's things as well up, up here. This all folds very flat, goes in the back of the car, and um, from memory, John, some of the big points of this is that um, if you go in with a supermarket trolley and you do your shopping you get your baby. Firstly, you've got to grab the baby, take them over, grab your, your trolley, put the baby in, do your shopping, come back to the car and you know, often you have to put the baby in the car, <coughs> unload the trolley and then leave the baby there and run over and put that trolley back. But with this arrangement here, you never leave the baby alone because the baby's there, the baby in the car, you unload, you fold it down and put it in the boot. Um, this folds ter terrifically, and I'm sure John will show us in a moment. Now, John also has expertise um, with um, sand, because John has looked after many grandchildren and his own children. Great-grandchildren. Great-grandchildren, and he knows you know, when, when, you, when you take them somewhere, there are places that are inaccessible to the wheels on a normal stroller. <coughs> and John has these wheels which will go across sand. Now, I can tell you that they work. Absolutely they work, because I go surf fishing with one of his old, earlier models. I <laughs> 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 put all the gear in there, he's even got a rod holder, and I've got all the rods sticking up to cross the beach, and all these fishermen are looking happy, you know, jealous. Uh, so you can, you can stroll across sand without any problem and they just um, click on and click off just like a uh, wheelchair, John, the uh, latest technology for wheelchair yes. wheels. Um, and uh, can you show us the umbrella, John? And if you have a little picnic, say down the beach, he's got a holder there and you screw that into the sand doesn't work on the polished floor, but it works in the sand or the grass. No, give us a little song. <coughs> the baby's protected. 
Heron is protected. John Evan has a picnic. I'll hold that, John. Evan has a picnic table so you can sit down with the baby and have a nice little picnic. And then uh, put it all back and um, home again. So, oh no, there's a Zesky that goes in there. <laughs> Which, as you can see, you know, goes right up the front there. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take this out, John. Um, so, John, can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, um, mothers with babies have a problem in that they can't use a normal stroller to do any decent shopping. A week shopping is totally out of the question. And they have that problem because every stroller on the market has a shopping basket, but it's small. And where is it located? It's located under the seat. So you've got to squat down to put something in it. So uh, even if a mother lives close enough to walk to the shops with the baby, she can't do it. So the options are you either make multiple trips during the week to get you know, a few things every time, or you take the car. Now, if you take the car, for a start, you've got to carry the baby out to the car, put it in the car seat. And if any of you here have done that recently, you'll know it's a pain in the neck. Then you drive to the supermarket and find a parking spot. Then you go and get a trolley, and it's got to be a trolley with a seat, and there's usually not a huge number of those. And some mothers worry about the hygiene factor because there's probably been plenty of babies in that with dirty nappies. So um, yeah, take the trolley back to the car, put the baby in the trolley, do your shopping, come back to the car, take all the shopping out, take the trolley back, carry the baby <coughs> back to the car, put it in the car seat, drive home, then make your mind up whether you leave the baby there and take the 15 bags of uh, shopping into the kitchen and come back to the baby or take the baby in and you're leaving the baby alone, eat, you know, whichever way you do it. Now, if you take this, you load the, provided you don't, don't have a, a, lots of steps around your house, you load the baby in this, in the house, you walk to the supermarket, you go in, and this is your trolley, so you're loading everything you buy into that, uh, back to the, to the uh, through the checkout, so you're just taking it out, putting it back in, you don't need as many plastic bags, then you walk home. And then you will the this thing into your kitchen and you <coughs> unload the baby and the shopping in the kitchen. End of story. So it's a dramatically simpler uh, operation. And hence the name Coolamon. Hence the name Coolamon. Yeah. Babies and food. Now, John, you've exceeded tilt standards, I believe. Yeah, I, 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 I was on the committee that rewrote the last scrolls. Standard, so I know all about what it has to comply with. And you have the automatic brake? Can't roll off the platform? No, no, it's not not yet. That's down the track. It's just the standard brake. The standard brake, so, but it has the brake. You just yeah. touch it yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And the, the other benefits of this is that, it, it, Peter said, it quickly <coughs> transforms <coughs> into a picnic or a shopping stroller. And if anybody here has ever tried to wheel a stroller on the sand, they'll know what the problems are. And you've got a zip bag here for sunglasses, car keys, purse. Yeah, yeah. and there'll be a coffee cup holder like every oh, um, coffee cup. Has, <laughs> <laughs> it has to have a coffee, coffee cup holder and a bottle yeah. holder. Um, another little pouch here for um, dirty nappies, dirty nappies, or anything else you want to or throw in there, just the just in rubbish. Been at the beach. Yeah, rubbish. Yeah. So, um, and it goes from uh, newborn to <coughs> fully laid back <coughs> to about a three-year-old. So it uh, is useful for quite a while. And then, of course, as the kids grow up and you want to go to the beach, then you continue using it. 
And then when the kids have left home, you can take this seat off and it's just an ordinary apartment cart or beach cart or whatever. John, thank you very much. I think it's fantastic. Uh, uh, number one, this is the prototype. It's ready for production and I'm just trying to raise the funds at the moment. So if anybody knows some rich investor, please let me know. John, John needs to get this off the ground. Um, as you can see, it's a perfectly done prototype. Um, it's got all the tooling. It's all ready to be done. Um, he's looking at different ways of financing it, so there's a plug uh, for John. Yeah, if anybody knows, I think you just couldn't go past it being a great stroller. Number one. Um, Excuse what? me, Peter, I've just been asked to show how it collapses. Is that okay with the back of the other wheel? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's down and the wheels come off to make it even flatter. And they just, you know, press, press button off. Yeah. So. There's a safety latch, which I never remember. There you go. Right, Coolabon, number one. One more time. Should be called the one All minute right. Coolabon. Should be called the one minute Coolabon. <laughs> one minute Coolabon. <laughs> one second. Okay. All right, look, uh, I'm only going to give you five minutes. We're getting on in time to mark your... I'd like to call on uh, Jack Karen to say a few words from the uh, floor on behalf of the members and, and guests. Um, I'd like to, on behalf of all the members, thank Peter for his lovely work this year. Uh, he did job. Uh, last month you might have noticed he was handing out awards to all the other people on the committee. Again, thank you all those on the committee. But he didn't do one for himself. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, we haven't got one for him tonight, but we, we should have. <laughs> um, but thank you very much, all the hard work you put in, um, all the hours. Uh, always, if a member's got a problem, they can ring you up and you, you give them advice and the feasibility committee will work on that prior. Um, but fantastic president, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, well, tonight, this is the prize. Our trophy, um, and the winner will take this home. Uh, they'll have to bring it back after Christmas to have it engraved. But um, that's what tonight's event is about, apart from our Christmas end of the year get together. Now, uh, I'll have to catch up with a few things here. So the slips are being counted right now out the back there. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm going to run a, a quick video. I suppose I should have set this up a moment ago, but I think it'll be really quick. Uh, while, while I'm setting this up, could I ask Gary Hegedus to come up, uh, please? Gary? Would a uh, um, we need to select a couple of uh, winners, don't we? Yeah, you and you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait a minute, don't well, we? Uh, no, more we, official than that. Um, okay, where's my barrel girl? John? John? Oh, we've got a new barrel girl, have we? <laughs> <laughs> we have a sexy seem sexy. Too close. <laughs> and the winner is? Oh no. Oh no, it's me again. <laughs> oh, that'll do. Oh, no. no, that just... oh. Ah. Ambrose, pleased to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy that, Ambrose. Hang on, one more, one more. Thank you. Oh, one more. Right. No, 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 you're not allowed to look, John. So yeah, um, above his eyes. Above his eyes. <laughs> 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 That's it. Good idea. <laughs> the second winner is. It's on the gold card. This is going to be good. John Brown, managing director. <laughs> oh, well. Well <laughs> so. 
So $200 voucher yeah, uh, credit yeah, towards we'll any work that yeah, you do? Absolutely. We'll see you in the studio and we'll, uh, we'll do something to, to help the project along. Mm -hmm. Always happy to help. It's great. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Thank you. We're going to see some of Gary's work right now. Uh, he donated this quick little uh, clip for us. I might have to turn it down. We'll see how we go. <laughs> Chief. In a year of many distractions, both politically and economically, the Inventors Association of Victoria has gotten stronger with good growth in our membership, particularly late in the year. One of the highlights has been the strong presence of new visitors at every meeting. Another highlight has been the great discussions that we've had at meetings about the real problems of inventing, which many visitors have told me afterwards was highly rewarding. We had a range of great speakers too, from Michael Lysenblatt of Bounce Back Fast, to Keith Draper, How to Market Your Invention, uh, Brian Lamont explaining offshore marketing and how to protect your intellectual property, uh, David Swalwell telling us about how inventive he is for the sheltered workshop Paramount Workforce, and how they can manufacture our products at competitive prices. Brian Vodosh from iPledge explaining crowdfunding and the workshop that he put on for us two weeks ago. And lastly, Gary Lowe, a business development manager explaining all about government grants and how to get them. Then as the year progressed, the successes of our inventors started to flow from Marcus McLeod, last year's Inventor of the Year Award winner, who had an article published about his boom banded smartphone crane by Terry Lane in the Green Guide of Thursday's Age, uh, to Rod Shepherd, who won the top award at the Hamilton Expo Sheep Fenchon with a $4,000 prize. Uh, next, we had Jack Kerrin's large editorial article in his local newspaper because he and three other of our members were in the top 10 finalists of the Floriati Aspiring Inventors Award. Peter Barrett then won the award with a total prize of $10,000, with 5,000 of that in cash, plus publicity on TV and on radio. Rod Shepherd then went on to achieve runner-up at the Henty Field Days with the same product that won at Sheep Venture. In mid-October, the committee were guests at the Bendigo Inventor Awards, where Len Williams, Michelle Hoffman, and Rod Shepherd were entrants. And in November, we had the crowdfunding workshop. As the Victorian Association for Inventors, we are now looking after our country members with the ability to watch our meetings on YouTube a couple of weeks after the event, because many of them cannot travel to meetings each month. Many good things have happened over the last 12 months and I expect even more in 2014. I want to thank you all for your loyalty, for your companionship, for your contributions and your help over the last year. And I wish you all the very best for the coming festive season. Thank you. Um, look, I'd like to uh, uh, quickly um, say, look, there are some of the achievements that we've had over the last 12 months, but um, there's also some other really great things happening. Um, I spoke in the newsletter when I spoke at the last meeting about the uh, Federal Association, the Inventors Association of Australia Federal. Um, this is not something that, that we need to be afraid of, that you know, we're going to join something else. Uh, this is just something to represent all of the state's inventors <coughs> and um, we, we can't go into it until it becomes a little freer because it was, there was a contract with, which got a few clauses and we can't agree to it. But they really want Victoria in there. We want to, I want to be there um, because the fellow in charge has got the right attitude. He wants to elevate inventors across the board. Uh, he wants to, to get a new level of respect for them. And some of the things that he's achieved is, in Western Australia, 
they have a patron. And the patron of the Venice Association uh, in Western Australia is Professor Lynn Beasley, Order of Australia, who is the Chief Scientist of Western Australia. Now, Peter Kasbrack, who is the President in West Australia, is this year the President of the Federal Inventors Association. Um, he, um, as, as, as President, uh, sorry, sir, he's President of the Federal Association and um, what he also was able to do, um, he and his uh, Vice President, uh, Dr. Adam Asarian, is they just managed to get uh, Professor Barry Marshall signed up as an ordinary member of the Inventors Association, the same association, not quite as big as us, in Western Australia. Now, um, I don't know if you, uh, anybody knows Barry Marshall, but uh, he's a Nobel Prize uh, winner, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, and he got the Nobel Prize in uh, medicine for discovering what caused peptic ulcers. And he's an inventor, and he's really happy to be part of the Inventors Association. So these are the sort of things that Peter Kasprak over there is trying to do for the association, all the associations in every state. You know, we, we just want, we want to become one whole, but very individual, by, by the way, every state's got to be very individual. But, you know, a member of one sort of body where um, Peter, Peter gets uh, myself, even though we're not a member, and the other three presidents around Australia to Scott. We did the first one about four weeks ago. Uh, we've got the next one in a couple of weeks. And it's just kind of, you know, saying hello, and what do you do in your association, and we want to help each other out. We want to, want to, want to sort of make the association strong in each state. Um, just a, a, a bit of a note about Barry Marshall, I said, you know, he's an inventor too. But um, getting this from Wikipedia, uh, Barry James Marshall, AC, FRACP, FRS, blah, 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 um, 19, born 1951, is an Australian physician, Nobel Prize laureate in physiology and medicine, and professor of clinical microbiology at the University of Western Australia. Now, Marshall and Robin Warren showed that the bacterium um, Helicobacter pylori is the cause of most peptic ulcers, reversing decades of medical doctrine holding that ulcers were caused by stress, spicy foods and too much acid. This discovery has allowed for a breakthrough in understanding a causative link between the Helicobacter pylori infection and stomach cancer. In 1979, Marshall was appointed as a registrar in medicine at the Royal Perth Hospital. He met Robert Warren, a pathologist interested in gastritis, during internal medicine fellowship training at Royal Perth Hospital in 1981. Together the pair studied the presence, and, and there's an interesting part of the story we'll get to in a moment. Um, they discovered the presence of spiral bacteria in association with gastritis. In 1982 they performed the initial culture of pylori, H. pylori and developed their hypothesis related to the bacterial cause of peptic ulcer and gastric cancer. It has been claimed that the H. pylori theory was ridiculed by the establishment scientists and doctors. As Bill told us before, it's pretty easy for inventors to be ridiculed. And here's, you know, one of the top people in medicine in Australia. And he was ridiculed by the establishment scientists and doctors who did not believe that any bacteria could live in the acidic environment of the stomach. Marshall has been quoted as saying in 1998 that everyone was against me but I knew I was right. He went on to drink a culture of the bacteria and got an ulcer three days later expecting it to take a year. I just need to give you all this warning. Please do not try doing this at home. <laughs> so he then treated it with um, antibiotics and proved that peptic ulcer was curable with uh, antibiotics and it was caused by bacteria. 
So, you know, time after time, inventors have been ridiculed for their ideas, and although some of them are clearly ridiculous, there are others that go on to become famous products after a great deal of persistence. And I don't think I've seen an invention yet in all of our, uh, in all of my time in the Inventors Association that I would call ridiculous. <coughs> now, a lot of people would, but I believe in every invention. It's just a matter of whether the person has the persistence to take it forward and become successful with it. It is a big job. Uh, it's a long process. And uh, that, to me, is the only limiting factor. I've, I've seen junk, absolute rubbish, sold in shops and sold, you know, lots of them, and they break as soon as you get them. And it's total rubbish. But people are making a lot of money out of it. You know, and then you see fantastic things that go nowhere. So it's all about the people behind it, and I hope that through our association and all the links that we're getting, that we can support inventors to give them that extra oomph and uh, get a lot of these products to um, commercialisation. Now, <coughs> today in the post, I... Um, okay. In the post today, I've got two two things. Can I, then, can I have that um, magazine, please? Incredible that both of these things should arrive on my doorstep today. But uh, this is a magazine, Go Farmer, a very high quality magazine. Um, it's mostly in the country areas and the bookshops, uh, and it's online. So they asked me if I could do an article. Uh, on inventing, and that's the article that I did. And they published it. And it's come out, you know, word for word, what, what I wrote. And it gives us a, a nice plug up here. Gives a couple of our inventors a plug, and um, that's just some of the things that we can do. You know, we can get get the um, the message out there. The other thing that came in the post is this wonderful. Uh, I thought there was another fold here somewhere. No, no, maybe not. Now, this product is called Sugru. And this idiot over here, Rod Shepard, <laughs> showed it to us uh, last month or a month before. <laughs> two months ago or not? Two months or one month? <laughs> two months ago. I think what he did. Okay, it's an idiot. Oh, he put up the boys. Oh, you know. Blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's the most interesting product. This is uh, developed by an inventor in the uh, UK. Uh, there are three little satchels in here of a compound that you mould, like plasticine, to whatever you want, and it overnight cures into a silicon rubber. So it's a soft silicon rubber. People are putting them on ski poles to give them a better grip you know, in the handle, they just mould it around and, you know, take off and, and it's permanent and it sticks to everything. Um, this person, one of, one of the big problems when they developed it was that it wouldn't stick to everything. And uh, so they got some grants and they did a lot more research and they were able to get it to stick to almost anything. Uh, so, um, so the little, little sachets, um, they, they give examples of, uh, you know, putting it on the corners of your phone. So if you drop your phone, um, usually it cracks the screen if you drop it on the corner. So if you just put a, a little lump on each corner, it's going to bounce, you know, it takes, it takes a shock out of it. Um, if a, a lead on, on the iron at home or anything else in the house is frayed, you can just, or if you think it might fray, if the old one frayed, you put a new one on, you can just mould the rubber around where the wire goes in the back there and give it a nice lumpy piece, it'll, it'll stick quite well and give it all that flexibility and strength uh, to, uh, you know, protect it. Um, this is used for heaps of things. It's used for um, you know, plugging up holes in shoes where, uh, on, on the outside, you know, to make it waterproof or something. Uh, it's a fabulous product and I got in touch with the inventor by email and um, just said if she's ever in Australia, we'd love to see it, you know. Come and show us a product. Uh, Rod introduced it 
to us and I looked it up on the website and thought this is really great. And um, anyway, she said that she doesn't have any plans to come to Australia at the moment, but she wondered if uh, we could use some samples. Uh, maybe we could run a competition. So she sent a box of samples and at the February meeting, we are going to, I'll, I'll be giving some out and at the March meeting, I want everybody to bring back their examples of what they've done with this product and uh, we'll have some prizes, some giveaways for what, what people at the meeting at that time consider to be uh, the best use of, of the product. So um, thanks Rob, it was you know a crazy name Subaru, I don't know what you're doing up there but it is a great little product. So there's a couple of things that, um, that have been happening. How are we going with the counting fellas? Oh, shut up, oh, sorry. Um, well, I think that uh, for the time being that's enough. We need to have a little bit more uh, to drink. <laughs> Probably a couple of things I, did, I didn't say is that um, this product is now being sold internationally. Uh, I don't think it's available in Australia. Um, it's uh, really moving across uh, the world and when uh, we run our competition, we'll take some photographs and we'll put that onto Facebook and we'll link with the Sugru site and uh, they'll probably publish a few things themselves. So in March, the winners uh, of this little competition that will run uh, should be you know, recognised internationally throughout the Sugru site. So you know, it's, it's not a small uh, thing. Well, um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, Frank, are you about? Frank, here he comes. Um, are we okay? Are we ready? We've just got about one minute to finalise the form. Oh, one minute. All right. Okay. Oh, so <laughs> okay. So, Ian, you'll be right to take yep. it. All right, um, next year I'd like to improve all the time. I'm going to have a drum roll. <laughs> oh, the computer! Oh, yeah, let's go, let's go. Right? We're nearly here! Hooray! We got the results! Okay, they've all been added up very, very carefully, and I've been told that it was very, very close. The top three was quite definite, but just the same, it was very close. There was no huge gap in, in the, the top three. Um, so, without any further delay, uh, Frank, could you give me the third place, please? Third place for Inventor of the Year goes to Archie Grogan. Archie. What about me? Thank you very much. Hey, Archie. Uh, what a pose for a photo. <laughs> Do you want to turn, 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 turn it around so we can see that, what it is? Yeah. He's got a grip like an iron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gallery Second gallery. place, Frank. Thank you. Second place for Inventor of the Year. Shall I do one of those reality show things? No, 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 no. no I've been delayed for 30 seconds. No. Sorry. Uh, second place Inventor of the Year is John Moltan with Philemon. Use the chopsticks. <laughs> John, congratulations. Thank you, Peter. 
Second place. And can you light these? <laughs> <second place? laughs> Smile for the camera. Page. Okay. Um, thank you very much, John. Well done, you two. <laughs> now, first prize for 2013 Inventor of the Year goes to. <laughs> Rod Shepard! <laughs> For Pump Defender. Even more. Inventor of the Year. Well done, Rod. Thanks, Jeff. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, firstly, to everybody who voted for me. Uh, and secondly, thank you to everybody who didn't vote for me. Um, but really, I think uh, my greatest thanks tonight should be reserved for everybody who's worked tirelessly behind the scenes tonight to put this event on. Um, in this association, there's lots and lots of people who just rock up and do stuff. Um, I'm not one of them because I come from a long, long way away. That's my excuse anyway. But nonetheless, that I see that there's lots of stuff that needs doing, and people do it tirelessly. And uh, to them, I say hurrah. Thank you. Do you want to move in, Peter? Stand oh, by. Right. Right. This is yours, one for <laughs> Yep. Thank you. Okay, look, uh, we don't have to be out of here until one o'clock. Oh. <laughs> The last one out is to clean up the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, and uh, just uh, you don't have to disperse straight away. Let's sit around, chat, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, have another drink. 